This week's guest is award-winning TV and film director, director of such things as The Omid Jalili Show, Rock Profiles, Brass Eye, Toast of London, and now the new documentary, King Rocker. Mr. Michael Cumming, how are you, Michael? Hello. Hey, I'm good. Good to see you in the good flesh. Good to see you. Well, yeah. not the flesh. But yeah. As close <laughs> as we can get. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no flesh allowed. Obviously, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about King Rocker. I, I, I understand you you saw the interview I did with Stu, so you, you know how much I love that documentary. I was worried you might be sick of talking about it. <laughs> um, but if I say things that Stu has covered, um, please tell me to just shut up and move on <laughs> to a more interesting area that he may have forgotten. Um, we've done a lot of. Um, it's been the the. It's been there's been a great uh, take up of the publicity, which is really great for us because, you know, we didn't know what people would make of it. But as a consequence, we might have said the same things over and over again, and um, I would hate that to happen. Yeah, it's it's been interesting because I've been listening to some of the un- other interviews that you've done and mm. and going, oh, that's new. I didn't hear that story. <laughs> that's the. Yeah. So there's still plenty for me to find out about. The yeah, thing. and I, I'm very good at making up uh, lies uh, about almost everything. So I can definitely put in a couple more lies if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but before we talk about King Rocker, I feel like it mm. would be a, a wasted opportunity not to uh, bring up some of your other work, as long as that's fine, all right with you. Yeah, yeah, bring it up. You've directed loads of comedy shows over the years. But I think the one that's, that obviously sticks out for a lot of comedy fans would be Brass Eye. You were the director of Brass Eye. And it's, yeah. such, it's such an iconic moment in sort of comedy history. Does, does it feel like that to you? Or does it just feel like a job you did 20 years ago? No, it definitely... Um, I mean, at the time, it felt like something very different. And I think I was aware that this was something that... Um, was not like anything else I'd ever seen on television, or it was going to hopefully be be that. But I, when I did Brass Eye, I'd never done any comedy before. I'd um, I'd left film school and I'd been a sort of jobbing director doing various things, which I didn't really enjoy. And, I, and in fact, I was almost considering packing it in, you know, because I wasn't really enjoying it. And it wasn't until I met Chris, really, and he he sort of convinced me, I suppose, that you could do something on television that was more interesting than than the normal sort of stuff and the normal comedy stuff. So I don't know if you saw it, but a couple of years ago, I made a film about Brass Eye called Oxide Ghosts, which I toured around the country. And it was specifically a live event only production. And because of that, you know, inevitably, I started thinking about it a lot. And, and um, that film... In fact, I, I showed it first in Wolverhampton, actually. Yeah. Unbelievably. I was at that screening. At the oh, you were at that screening? Yeah. Okay. Well, that was an unfinished version of it. I did a short version of it um, as a, like a test screener because I was doing a talk at the Lighthouse. And, um, okay, so you had, you've seen that version of it. Well, that was the first time it had ever been seen when you saw it. Oh, and wow. it wasn't finished then. And I, after that, I took it away and I did some re-edits on it. And obviously, I added a lot more material or in fact, I think I'd already got the material. I just made a shorter version for that screening because there wasn't time. And and I was sort of t- took some of the reactions that night as sort of indicators of what were good and things that maybe needed to move or the mix wasn't very good and I needed to mess around with it a bit. But that because of that, I, I as I say, I showed that first and that was designed for a one-off uh, screening that I was going to do in Manchester at a, film fe- a TV festival on the 20th anniversary of Brass Eye. And it was... The guy asked me if I, you know, if I do it. And I just sort of said to him, yeah, I'd be happy to do it. And I've got a few outtakes, I think, somewhere on some VHS tapes. Maybe I'll have a look and I can find one and it'd be quite nice to show one, you know. And I just started looking through all this material. I got all the VHSs. I got boxes of VHS tapes that I'd been sort of carting around with me all my life. Because, like, as you said, I think when I was doing it, I was aware that this was something sort of special and different and I don't normally keep all the tapes of everything that I do you know they go they go you know in fact well there aren't any tapes now but you know back in those days but I sort of think at the back of my mind I sort of thought this might be interesting one day and I hadn't looked at it for a long time and I think Chris and I were aware that this material was there 
but we didn't want to sort of just put it on the internet and give it away as it were. So anyway, I just started sifting through it and I pulled a clip out here and I put it into my edit thing. And then I thought, oh, that's a good clip. And oh, that looks like a good, and by the time I'd finished, I had an hour and a half of this stuff. And then I thought, well, I wonder if it could be a film, you know, if, if, if there could be some sort of a film, not a documentary, because it isn't really, I never described it as a documentary because it isn't a documentary. Mm. It's a sort of, you know, in the way of King Rocker, it's a sort of unreliable <laughs> memoir, I suppose. And it's my sort of unreliable memories, some of which might not even be true, you know, but as a consequence of making it, I, it, it suddenly people started to get interested in it. Anyway, I, as I say, I made it as a one-off and I think up to now I've done about 85 screenings of it you know all around the country it was really gratifying to sort of think that this thing that you made all those years ago in this sort of throwaway medium of tv which is very you know things get forgotten was still remembered so fondly um and at those events i would do a q a afterwards so i did i was sort of forced to think about it really and i was forced to sort of realize that people did did you know did hold it in some kind of uh, regard and I was I was really pleased about that because I th I know that I would have done as a fan of things you know that would have been something I would have uh, you know I would have liked to have seen you know the behind the scenes sort of making of something like that so um, and you know hopefully I'll continue to show that film if and when films can can be shown I had a lot of stuff I had to cancel but you know two or three years down the line now it's it's um, I still get asked to show it at very you know at festivals and things like that i suppose it's because um chris is obviously a very private sort of stays out of the limelight kind of thing it, it it's almost mythical in a way isn't it some some of the brass eye and the different projects that he's worked on so to yeah. get a little sneak peek behind the the curtain as it were you know was excited like uh, you know as a comedy fan that when someone told me, oh, yeah, Michael Cummins showing this um, brass eye, I was like, oh, yeah, count me in, you know, straight away. Well, it was that. And I, and, I, and I think up until that point, I and Chris have both been reticent about talking too much about it. And I know there was a book uh, written about Chris in that period called Disgusting Bliss, which they did ask me to contribute to. And I declined to contribute to that because I sort of thought, well, we'd always said, let's let's just shut up about it. And... Um, and I sort of thought that maybe one day I would say some things about it. So I wanted to do it on my own um, terms. But I think part, I think, you know, when I'd made the film, I realised that I would never be able to show it unless Chris was happy with that. So I showed it to him and um, I suppose I expected that he would either go, nah, don't show that. Or he would sort of go, well, cut that bit out. Don't put that in. I'm not sure about that bit. But he just said he really enjoyed it. He liked it and, you know, was sort of happy for it to to go out as exactly as it was. So the version that I showed was exactly the original one that I'd made with no sort of changes for him. And he was really supportive about it. And I think, you know, if anything, it helped to sort of keep, although there were a few sort of bits, bits and pieces of secrets that I told, a lot of them had been sort of floating around as rumours anyway, um, and I deliberately tried to keep it, you know, quite ambiguous, not sort of saying, well, this happened and this, you know, it was a it was a sort of floaty, ambiguous, drifty kind of film where who knows what is and isn't true, you know. So uh, so it, it, I wanted to do something more like that and, and hopefully it piqued people's interest to, to maybe sort of check it out again and look again at it. And um, which I think it did. Absolutely. Do, so is that. Is that always forever going to be just a live thing that's never going to get a release or? I, well, I don't really want it to, no, because it, I like the, the sort of special, unique thing of it. And I like showing it in rooms full of people. You know, I mean, I like anything in a room full of people now would be amazing, yeah. wouldn't it? Um, and I think when people do start to be allowed to go into rooms again, it's going to be an amazing thing um, for everybody. But but I liked that because when you do what I do, which is, you know, you make stuff that's on telly um, largely, you, you don't really, you know, people can say, oh, I like that, whatever. But you don't ever see their, you don't ever get a situation to see where the, how they react to it. Yeah. And people do react differently when it's a big room of 
people, don't they? You know, people are tending to sort of laugh out loud and things that you might just have a little chuckle at home. When you're in a room of other people, it becomes infectious, doesn't it? And you, and you sort of, you know. So I, I what I liked really was just um, standing at the back, watching, you know, hearing people laugh at this twenty-year-old stuff, or, e or not only laugh but sort of <gasps> gasps of, oh my god, you know, because some of the stuff seems worse now than it did then, you know. Um, somehow, I think time has made it even more difficult to watch some of it. Um, so I think that that experience of it being live is a good thing. And also, yeah, it's just not, I think it's just nice, isn't it? In this, you know, you can sort of get everything, find everything every online. And it's um, it's nice to have this one thing that you have to go out and experience as a live, a live event, really. And then obviously, like I say, you've directed so much TV. We could be here all day talking about all the uh, the different comedy shows you've worked huh. on. Let's not do that, though. <laughs> <laughs> you directed uh, Toast of London, which the first series you won the, the Rose Door for. Yeah, it won a few things. That I think Comedy yeah. Award and Rose Door and yeah, uh, which would surprise me more than I mean, I love Toast. It's a it's again, Toast is one of those things that I, I know that if it was on TV and I had nothing to do with it, I would love it. Yeah. And so to be able to be part of its creation is is just a, a, a lovely thing. But um, but I didn't ever think, you know, like a lot of these things, a lot of the really good things, or a lot of the things I enjoy making, I've got sort of quite small but obsessive followings, you know. So yeah. not that many people, well, certainly when the first series came, I think more people have heard of Toast now because it's been on Netflix and it's gathered a sort of, it's gone beyond being a cult thing. It sort of is a bit known, but... Certainly at the beginning, people, you know, it didn't have a huge amount of viewing, uh, you know, viewing figures or whatever. And uh, it was sort of slightly in that sort of cult thing. But I was really surprised that it it got taken up. We made a pilot for it um, as a one off, which was broadcast on Channel 4. Yeah. And after that pilot, I just thought, this is really good. I really like this it'll never get made, you know, because <laughs> my instinct on this thing is I usually, you know, the things I really like and enjoy just don't get picked up. So I was really surprised, but so pleased when it, when they said, yeah, we're going to do a series. And then it sort of gathered, I think critically it did well, you know, but critics seemed to like it, even though it perhaps didn't, you know, have the sort of, it wasn't in the Mrs. Brown's boys uh, league of, uh, <laughs> of viewing figures, but you know, that's, that's the way I, that's where I'd like to be. Really, yeah. I don't want to be, you know, um, but it's, it, that was such a great thing to do and such a brilliant, I'd known Matt Berry for a while and I directed his series Snuffbox years before that with Rich Fulcher, which again is one of those, but not forgotten because I think people have found it since Toast. They've sort of looked back on his things. But at the time, it was it sort of languished in a slightly forgotten area. Um, but it was such a fantastic thing to work on and um, working with Matt and Rich Fulcher on that. Again, it was one of those I love it. They'll never make it, you know, sort of thing. But I think the difference with the difference with Snuffbox was I think we knew that we probably that would probably be the it would be a one-off it wasn't going to be a long-running hit tv series it was just too sort of unusual and um but toast we really did once we'd done that got that first series going i think everybody could sort of see the potential of these characters and the actors who played those characters were so brilliant at being those people the the sort of you could just see how the story like you know when you've got the Ray purchases and the Eds and the, those sort of characters, you you just think, oh, I want to see what, how would they react if this happened? And what would happen if Toast had to do, you know, you could sort of, we really wanted to make more. So it, it was, you know, we got a good run of it, three, three series, which was great. Yeah. It's, you know, that lots of stuff isn't given time to sort of find its audience these days as well, is it? It's like, if it doesn't pick up straight away, it's done mm. it's a failure where it's like at at least having the slow burn of it you you got to find the audience and like you say started off a bit more culty but then grow that a little bit as 
you know, as you learn to like the characters, well, not necessarily like the characters in Toast. <laughs> Abhor them, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and I think in a way, if you look back to the the sort of golden age of television comedy, three series is absolutely nothing. You know, to be to 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 get three series was like a bit of a failure, really. Now, if you get three series, you're really you're sort of lucky, and it's almost like once you've had three series, it's like, well, you've had your fun now. We need to get the next. Especially, you know, it, it saddened me a little bit that when we were doing that on Channel 4, we sort of had, I mean, great that we did, but we it was almost like, well, you've got the weird comedy franchise for three years. We can't have any others. You've got it. And if we want some others, you're going to have to get off the air to allow us to get the next one on. It wasn't like we could have two or three different interesting shows. So that, that seemed a pity. Um, Obviously, like you were saying earlier, you got your start in TV doing stuff for like tomorrow's world and little pieces like that wasn't it was was your first comedy thing um the mark thomas product or was no brass i was brass before i was first mark thomas. yeah and mark had had his first i didn't do the ver- the very first series of mark thomas was on just before brass i uh, that's where I'm um going. and then i joined it in the second series because they wanted a slight change of um uh scenery i suppose but yeah so to- so so brass i was you know the baptism of comedy fire <laughs> so it's ridiculous to think that like again something so iconic was sort of your first dir- you know big comedy directing job you know yeah but- i mean i've been directing for quite a while and chris had done a few things before but but it was i think uh, people sort of have asked why you know why did you get that how come you got that job you'd never done any comedy but i think it was part of that you know chris is great at making when I met him, apart from the fact we seem to get on and, and, um, but I think he deliberately didn't want to go for a sort of the obvious, you know, get a comedy thing. He was parodying the sorts of programs I had probably made, you know, yeah. to an extent, although I hadn't really done that. I'd never really done any sort of current affairs stuff, but I'd sort of done lots of different kinds of TV, but maybe he just didn't want that sort of thing. It wasn't, it, you know, we took the sort of the parodying element of it and the way we copied other kinds of things quite seriously. So, you know, we'd really analyse what people were doing and try to make it really, really believable. And and um, the comedy came from the reality of it, not sort of, you know, cra- well, there was a lot of crazy shit. Well, honestly, <laughs> but I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of, yeah, I'd languished for a long time, not for a long time, but I'd done quite a lot of other, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I well, I studied fine art at, in Wolverhampton at the art yeah. school in Wolverhampton, Um which we can talk about if you want, but it's a, that was an incredibly import, important time for me um, because I went there to sort of, I went there thinking maybe I'd be a painter or something, you know, but but because of the amazing people there, I, that I met the students and the tutors and it just sort of opened up a whole world of stuff that I just didn't know existed. I mean, I didn't really know there was a kind of art you could make that involved video and film. Um, and it wasn't there wasn't that many people doing it at, at, the, at Wolves at that time. But there was an amazing tutor called Guy Sherwin there, who is a filmmaker, an independent filmmaker, who made these absolutely beautiful black and white 16 millimeter films. And he would come do one or two days a week. And because I was sort of the only person really doing it at, uh, up there at the time, I sort of had his full attention. And he was just, you know, he just opened up my mind to all these things that could do. And it was him that... So I was making sort of art, video art, I suppose you'd call it, um, things that you might show in a gallery or, you know, no, no, not that anybody would really, you know, you'd take it to a film festival or something, but, you know, not many people would ever see it. But um, I got, so, I sort of decided that that was the way I wanted to go. And I ended up just completely doing that. So my graduation show was all video, all on videotape. And um it was really easy for me to sort of stand out in that context because everybody else was either a painter or a sculpture. So I was the one who wasn't that. And so it was by definition, people go, Oh, what's this then? This is a bloke with a telly in the gallery, not the paintings. Well, let's watch that. So that, you know, but, but he, but Guy Showin was the person who sort of said to me, well, you know, do you, have you thought about maybe applying to something where you get a bit more formal training or how to do it? Because we just made it up. I had, there was no technical, literally there was a, in Wolverhampton there was a cupboard with some slightly broken cameras in it and because the, they used to run a course there but they no longer did 
And if you fancied sort of working out where everything plugged in, you could have a try and it put most people off. I wasn't sort of that intimidated by that because I'd done music all my life and I'd sort of plugged things in and I quite liked the idea of, of that. So I just sort of worked it out myself, but I didn't have any technical knowledge at all about it. Anyway, he, he suggests, he said, sort of said, well, why not apply to the Royal College of Art? They've got a, a master's in film. And I think after I'd stopped laughing, I sort of went, well, what do you do then? And he said, well, you know, you're going to have to make a film that's got like narrative. You can't just make this art stuff. You've got to make something with a bit of narrative, a story and, you know, find an actor and all that sort of thing. And I had no idea what, you know, how to do that, what you were supposed to do. But with a friend of mine, uh, Mike Williams, who was a painter at the college, we just sort of came up with a couple of ideas and he acted in it. And anyway, I made this thing specifically to send to the Royal College and, unbelievably and I'm not really sure why they they took me on you know six students a year um so I was one of six people and that that's I suppose that was the sort of second turning point where I actually learned how you actually supposed to do it then yeah um and then of course so, so when I left I was able to you know although although sort of tomorrow's world and I don't know if people will even remember tomorrow as well, but it was a very straight laced sort of science based uh, program with presenters in studios. And, but they would have these little film reports and I used to direct the little film report. I had no uh, knowledge about science, no interest in science, but you know, 14 million people watch tomorrow's world in, in, uh, you know, after it was on after top of the pops or before top of the pops on a Thursday night and it had massive viewing figures. So, it meant that when I left there, I had some stuff that people, you know, even though it was not the most groundbreaking work of my career, people at least had gone, oh, okay, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. And so I sort of gradually just did bits and bobs of jobbing stuff, you know, and, and I was, as I said before, I was to the point of thinking, God, this is terrible. I want to go back and just make video art and put it in a gallery and be poor and have a, you know, enjoy it. And it was only, you know, meeting Chris where I, I sort of thought, ah, oh, here's a man who wants to do something on television but that, that's not like normal television you know yeah but it, it sounds like then that you've always sort of you, you know you, you you know how to do things properly but you've got that sort of diy let's let's have a go let's let's try something yeah this and this doing this king rocker film was absolutely it just reminded me of the diy Thing again. I mean, the Nightingales as a band are a DIY kind yeah. of thing, and they have been, and they've often released their own material, and they've, you know, they they survive in that way, and so it felt right to do it in that way. But we had to do it in that way because we didn't have the funding to do it in any other way. Um, and Stuart and I really, with help from Fire Films and uh, James at Fire Films, we 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 sort of between us cobbled it together if you like you know they weren't a proper tv production company they were a record label um Stuart and i had never made a documentary before and to save us the money i edited it all myself in this room and saved a you know a shitload of money but it's not something i'd ever done since since art school really i'd always worked with the best editors around and probably not paid enough attention to what they were doing i realize now otherwise it wouldn't have taken two years to make but <laughs> but it, it felt you know there was times that are infuriating but what it what was amazing was just i suppose just the feeling that after doing it for so long there's still loads of new stuff you could learn yeah and you know apart from the technical stuff loads of stuff i could learn from Stuart, who he's just you know he he says, you know, he, he's not sometimes not comfortable in front of the camera doing those things, but he's just so great at talking to, you know, he just works so well with Rob in the film, like as a, as a sort of double act almost. And, and yeah. he's so puts people at their ease and, you know, he's funny, but he's not like a sort of selfishly funny. He'll sort of set up things to make Rob look fun, you know, to refer so Rob can be fun. You know, it was just, I learned a lot of, from him and the way he sort of plots out ideas and stories and, and sort of likes to make stories like his stand up is, you know, the way he weaves a story in that. Um, but it did. Yeah. It felt like, you know, it was all made, you know, Stuart would come up to my house for a couple of days and we'd sort of look at some stuff and decide what we might do next and then think, okay, well let's film that. And yeah, it was just a very organic um, make it up as you go along. <laughs> Uh, sort of I was, thing, really. I was going to ask you about that. Where it's like, did 
going in, did you have the story planned out? Is like these are the beats, or did you find that through the edit and through making it? Well, we didn't. I mean, I think that was through making it, and I think Stuart had a sort of a bit of a structure in his mind that he wanted to do. But actually, the way we said from the beginning, it would make sense to. I mean, at first we talked about maybe not doing it chronologically, which is an interesting way of doing it. And and it isn't completely chronological, of course, because, you know, it can't be. But it does roughly break, break down into the first section is about the prefects and the sort of punk scene in Birmingham. Uh, the next is, there's not, you know, the formation of the Nightingales and the first phase of the Nightingales. And then there's a third section where Rob sort of gives up the musical music business as a performer and becomes a producer of successful producer of videos and then gets sick of that and ends up as a sort of postman and sort of down on his luck which is great for a story and then the sort of final bit is you know he thinks this isn't good for me I need to move back to Birmingham put a band together start writing lyrics again and and um and then we see the Nightingales as they are now which is this very different proposition this amazing contemporary band really that you know don't play their old songs, continue to write music. I've got a brilliant, you know, brilliant lineup of musicians with this incredible drummer Fliss and and Andy on bass and Jim on guitar. They they just seem to work as a as a as a really powerful unit now in a in a very different way to the original band. But you know, so it's a film that kind of ends on a high, not one of those films where you think oh then they all split up and then they died and it was over you know it sort of ends as a it's a, it's a sort of onward an onward forward thing and hopefully it'll you know the hope is people might you know it's been great that people who are fans of the band have liked it the, the ones who've seen it but it's been even better that you know, quite a few people, Stuart and I have spoken to, have said, oh, I'd never heard of the Nightingales. But, uh, you know, after watching your film, I've been, you know, checking out their stuff and I've ordered a couple of their records and I've been listening to them on the Spotify or whatever. You know, that was also part of the that thing of, you know, which I remember about loving the band. And especially my main memory of it is more when I, 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 I when, when, um, when I was at Wolverhampton, I think Hysterics was, was kicking around um, just for visual punctuation. Uh, that was kicking around and, and I used to listen to that, but it was only when I went, moved to London to, to the Royal College, they just released this brilliant album called In the Good Old Country Way, which was a sort of bizarre post-punk country record. <laughs> I don't know what you'd call it. And it, it was just the sort of thing that nobody had heard of. And when you try, when you move to London for the first time and you're in a trendy sort of film school and they've all got sort of Depeche Mode hairstyles, you want to um, have something that they go, Ooh, what's that then? What's that? And that was my, oh, what's that then? And they, and and so I would listen to that a lot, you know, a, a lot at that period. Um, and and that that thing of trying to tell people you know about a band that you really like that they haven't heard of. I suppose the King Rock is just that writ large, isn't it? For me yeah. and Stuart, you know, that this is the one that you should have heard of, but you haven't. And now we're going to force you to have heard of them because you know we go and talk about it on podcast like this <laughs> but i feel like that with the documentary is you're not you're not necessarily forcing the music down people's throats or anything are you, you like no the, it makes you fall in love with the people like robert and fliss and the rest of the band yeah. Yeah. rather than going what about this song what about this song it's like look at these humans and you know that's what i took away from it completely and in that and i think I think if it was just a sort of fan video, um, which we could have made, um, it would be more like that. But there isn't, you know, there isn't a massive amount of music in because I think we wanted to bring people. I think what Stuart and I thought at the time was, I think if you're a fan of this band, you'll be so happy that there's something being made about them that you'll watch it anyway. So we don't have to worry about the fans, hopefully. What would be nice is to try and draw people in, as you say, just by this sort of story of this extraordinary man's life, and um, and the ups and downs of anybody's life are interesting, aren't they? Yeah. And um, and he's a particularly sort of interesting, clever bloke who, you know, has, has carved out this, I suppose, this path that's on the outside of what you would consider the the music business. Um, and I've always been fascinated by 
people who can uh, who can do that and and um you know part of me wishes i was still making videos in art galleries that that you know that didn't that was sort of that and I, and I do still do that i still do that as a thing but it's not my main thing and it's interesting isn't it because i think in the world of sort of directors and tv directors i probably am seen as somebody who's more on the margins of stuff but but by the same token it's not like being you know a video artist who has got no funding and who has to you know sit around you know you know what i'm saying anyway. yeah it's, but you uh, do but if, if you've done that to yourself though to a certain degree haven't you where it's like mm. you've had years of having tv budgets to make things but for this mm. you know it's you and Stuart and the little bit of money you've raised it, you know you've so you've sort of given yourself a, a hurdle almost to overcome of like not having yeah. that money and not having a big crew yeah there's there is that but there's also the the fact that probably nobody would have given us the money to do. I mean we did when when I first talked to Stuart about it I remember I went to see one of his shows and we I met him afterwards and we, we were talking about it and we and he sort of said, well, do you think we could? Should we get a meeting at the BBC and see if they'd be interested in it? And then we both just sort of looked at each other and went, nah, that's not going to happen, is it? It's not going to happen. And and um, it, it's a tricky one because there's times where you think it might have been nicer to have a bit of funding, but actually, I'm glad we didn't because we didn't have anybody telling us what to do and we you know in in James Nichols at Fire who was our producer nominally because he said he would be for us which was fantastic but he's not like a producer who's like a producer producer he just his production role was to support us you know and to make try and make happen what we wanted to happen but not sort of go oh well you better not do that because it's not a very catchy song and why don't you make it a bit more mainstream because then we'll sell it to Netflix and you know it wasn't we didn't have that which yeah you know, it could have happened if there had been money from a proper backer. Because that's why I brought up uh, the Mark Thomas comedy product, because I wondered mm. if the the sort of, you know, the guerrilla style of that and sort of having to deal with things as they happened while you were filming that, like if that came into came handy when, you know, you were making a, a sort of guerrilla <laughs> style documentary. It did a bit. And and in fact, it's funny you say that because there's a couple of times when we were doing things without real, you know, we were filming in places without proper permissions and Stuart was very jittery about it because he's like a recognisable person. And uh, to me, I didn't even think twice. About it. I thought, well, this isn't, you know, <laughs> I, I was illegally uh, sitting on the White House lawn with Mark Thomas and uh, we shouldn't have really been there. We blagged our way in doing an interview and then we got kicked out. I thought that's that's when it gets hairy, not not standing on in Birmingham station trying to film, you know, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I remember that. It seems such a long time ago that um, the Mark Thomas stuff, but it was a, again, that's a series that, um, you know, it feels like, I mean, it is sort of of its time, I suppose, to an extent, but it, it um, it's a pity there aren't, you know, those sorts of things, you know, we could do with those kind of Absolutely. things now but of course like all these things are harder to do in this you know in the same way that brass eye would be very hard to make now i imagine mark would be hard to do just because you know people know who he is and everybody's got a phone and there's a social media to blow everything on and you know but yeah yeah some of some of his uh recent stand-up shows have been like spectacular the way he tells stories is uh amazing yeah and those for me are the people i mean i don't really I don't really watch, I don't really consume stand-up comedy. I don't really know who much about the I love Stuart's work. And, uh, you know, when Mark's in town, I go and see him. And Mark Steele, who I worked with a lot, I, I love his stuff. And they're more storytellers, really, yeah. to me, they're, they're than gag merchants, you know. <laughs> it, it's like Stuart's style of stand-up where he... I know he he doesn't like the term, but where he sort of deconstru deconstructs stand up as he's doing it, and mm. you've obviously done a lot of work that sort of breaks the fourth wall, or you know where you you play around with the format of television, and I loved mm. the crossover to that in King Rocker, where there's moments in King Rocker where that shouldn't be in that should have been edited out, but they make it so much better. Where you you got Stuart saying. 
tell that story, but act like I haven't a- asked you to tell that story, but you've left that yeah. bit in. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, and I think it became apparent quickly that 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 would be a good way of, you know, sort of looking at you know a documentary that slightly looks at the way documentaries are made. To me, seems very uh, the right kind of thing to be doing, and. That's that sort of thing came up quite quickly, even after the, sort of one of the first things we did, where we were at Six Music and um, with Mark Riley, and um, there was some debate about the truth of some of the things that um, that were being said in the interview. And then we thought, well, then we've just got to go and immediately cut to those people either denying or confirming no. those those stories. And but yeah, the, the sort of showing your workings in the margins and and deconstructing TV has always been something. I've enjoyed, I mean, obviously, Brass I would did it, but when I was making video art, um, to me, it seemed logical that if you were making something that was going to be shown on a TV screen that wasn't television, you co- could use it to criticize television. So, a lot of the, the work that I did when I was a student uh, in Wolverhampton was um, video that that looked in on television and revealed the methods of making television and the way it was constructed. And I I think if I did this documentary again, it would be even more about how documentaries are a sort of constructed reality, aren't they? And you make stories out of things and you, you know, um, but Stuart's so very good at, at delivering that sort of an idea that it, it was easy and it didn't felt, it didn't feel clunky and that it was, you know, the, the worry would be that you do something like that and it would be a bit sort of obviously sort of contrive, but it's very natural the way Stuart does it and the way Rob um, responds to those yeah. things, but very sort of knowingly. But at the same time, I think we did manage to get quite a few really sort of heartfelt moments in there that were genuine Absolutely. moments in amongst it. And And if, you know, when you watch it, you kind of, don't know which are the realities and which are the not realities on the more the better really you know yeah i, I that's what I, I like about the the film is that it feels like every pub story you've ever been told where you go well is that true how much of that has been made up how, how much of yeah. that has got changed over the years yeah. and now and now what i like even more is that the way now we're talking about it a lot the yeah. stories around the making of it are starting to get blurred as well. You know, Rob's version of how, of how I heard Rob talking on a thing the other day and his version of how it got made and how the, the ideas came about are very different from the story Stuart's been telling. Uh, so even the sort of background of it is now sort of confused. <laughs> uh. Is there is there lots of footage that you didn't use? Are there like you know sort of story arcs that you went down that didn't pay off? Or um, well, not really story arcs, but there's a yeah. lot of material. There's a lot of really good material, and um, and that will hopefully will come out. We, we've got um, a DVD planned for later right. in the year. I think November the DVD will come out, and I've just finished cutting the extras for that. And there's actually more extras than the length of the film. <laughs> Because I just thought, well, this is the one time to get everything that there is, that we've got about the Nightingales out. If you yeah. want it, you might as well have it. And there's some really good bits from other people, either that we couldn't fit in because of time, or you know, probably I should have made them into another film and toured them as Oxide uh, <laughs> Rocker or something in ten years' time. But instead of doing that, we'll put them out. But um, yeah, there, there's other people. I think you know, there's other stories from people that are in the film that maybe we thought they didn't fit in the film because they were a bit too sort of bloke talking head type yeah. of things, but they're good stories. Um, and the, yeah, there's bits, you know, there's avenues that we couldn't explore further because it just took you away. We, I think we, the film could have run easily run at two hours. My, my cut of it was at two hours and you could have run it at two hours, but we thought, no, let's not be, you know, let's make it a film that's the length that normal films yeah. are and make it snappy. And so Stuart and I sat and sort of what I thought was going to be a very sort of painful, how do we get half an hour out of it? We literally just did one evening over a bottle of fine wine and just <laughs> went bang, 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 bang. What do you think? Yeah, that's it. And and sort of did it with sort of, you know, don't, don't feel attached to it. Just, yeah. you know, let's make the story rock on. So 
Um, so yeah, there's there's plenty of good. There's some really good stuff um, that will be coming out on the DVD, and there's also um, there's also a thing that we were going to do, which isn't hasn't been sort of announced yet. So I won't go into details of it. But we shot um, a fantastic gig uh, with the Nightingales, supported by Stuart um, from the tour of which in the film there's a couple of minutes of it but it's a yeah. whole 90 minute gig of the nightingales in absolute blistering form um with Stuart supporting them doing his 1980s uh, club set um and we're going to put that out as a streaming uh, option in march i think but that'll all be you know announced on the the king rocker film website and on the nightingale you know you can find out about the film and the various Things and the other thing that we want to do is Stuart and I want to show it in some cinemas when they open and do Q and A's and you know we're hoping that maybe September October time we can do that um, and we will be you know touring it around and we'll be definitely in the West Midlands for sure <laughs> but um, we'll hope we'll hopefully be everywhere but we've got to be there because obviously you know, that's where it all comes from right? <laughs> that's mm. the you know what watching it as well is like. Wait, the, as soon as someone mentions like Canuck and Telford and all, I'm <laughs> yeah, just like, oh, yeah. it's so happy. I'm like, it's so rare that someone shows that much love for like, you know, the Midlands. And it's obvious how, how fond you and Stuart are of the Midlands. Like it really comes across in the film, you know. I really enjoyed coming back. You know, I have to confess, I hadn't been back to Wolverhampton much over the years. And then suddenly two things happened. One was doing this film where I came back a lot. And then the other amazing thing is they they gave me this honorary doctorate. So I'm now a doctor, uh, which I noticed you haven't called me throughout this oh, yeah, entire sorry. interview. So we'll have to go back and re-record certain sections. <laughs> but I go, you go, doctor, before each <laughs> bit. Um, but which was just great. And, and, and as a consequence of that, I ended up coming to Wolverhampton quite a lot and doing some talks and sort of reconnecting really with a lot of memories, I suppose. They showed me around there again and it doesn't look that much different on the inside it still felt like the same sort of thing um going on there although i don't think they perhaps do as much experimental video well they didn't do any then either did they i've just said <laughs> they didn't so they probably do about as much of that but but yeah uh, so i've yeah i have i've really enjoyed sort of sort of reconnecting with that sort of yeah. brief but you know it was a brief time that i was there but it was a very it's that time in your life when you go away to college, you know, I came from the middle of nowhere in the Lake district I grew up. So, and it was great and I loved it. And, and, um, but, but it was, you know, I'd never had a curry and I'd never heard of John Cage and I'd never, but, you know, seen people painting big canvases and I'd never, you know, met, you know, some of the, you know, when I was a student there, uh, we had our visiting tutors were Anish Kapoor the young Anish Kapoor who just used to come and sort of hang out and talk to us and show us his piles of colored sand and stuff and um and Roger McGough the Liverpool poet Roger McGough used to come and do his readings because he was one of the external assessors and an artist called Ian Breakwell who was a massive influence on me and probably people won't have heard of Ian Breakwell but they invited him to come to the college just because they thought I would be interested as the only person making video. And though, you know, things like that, just, you know, they, they sort of changed your life, you know, and um, although there wasn't a massive amount going on in Wolverhampton itself, the college just had, they put on everything. There was great gigs, films, comedy, cheap drinks. It was, everything was within that, that place. And I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure it's things change over the years, but it, it was like a sort of assault of, you know, ideas onto my brain. So, I, you know, I've been able to go back there and film, you know, there's quite a lot of it filmed in Wolverhampton, yeah. actually. I mean, there's quite a bit in Birmingham as well, but there is surprisingly a lot shot in uh, in and around those windy underpasses <laughs> that I remember. As soon as I walked in there, the wind came whistling through that underpass by the Molyneux, yeah. and I thought, shit, I remember that wind <laughs> coming through there. <laughs> Bad town planning wind. <laughs> February the 6th at nine o'clock, <laughs> King Rocker on Sky Arts. There we go. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> very good. And, and all things King Rocker. I mean, as I say, there is loads of stuff going to happen. DVD, there's going to be um, a single is coming out in celebration of it. I don't know. Can I talk about the single? 
Nightingale's B.W. Stuart Lee, Ooh. Lim- limited edition single. There's going to be a soundtrack album um, and there are going to be live screenings, which will be much better than when it's on Sky because it'll all be in one long film and with no adverts. And Stuart will tell some funny jokes, probably <laughs> just by accident. And um, I'll sort of pretend that I knew what I was doing when we made it in a QA. and a And, you know, so it'd be good to, for people to hopefully we'll be able to come along to that. So, yeah, there's lots of, and as I say, the streaming Stuart Lee Nightingale's gig. So, yeah, the, just keep checking out the old, um, the old King Rocker um, website and um, yeah. all kind of social media that I don't really understand and I'm not on, but there's all kinds of Twitter, Instagram things, isn't there? I don't yeah. know. You, I'll, you li- I'll, I'll link everything down below anyway all the the different king rocker sites and to the nightingales and different things for people to check out I'll, and I'll the nightingales new album the nightingales new album isn't half bloody superb as well so um you'd be foolish not to get your hands on a vinyl copy of that before it sells out which it yeah. will do after it's gone out on sky um four against fate come on you know you want it <laughs> i have a there's a <laughs> tiny little Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Nice. <laughs> well, I feel like I've I've got enough views out of the Nightingales in the past couple of weeks, so it's only fair that I support them as well. <laughs> yeah. Well, quite right. And I mean, I hopefully they'll get, be able to get back and tour. They've, they've had a cancelled, you know, the tour of the album, the Four Against Fate album, which is one of their great albums for sure. They've not been able to tour it at all because it came out just when everything shut down i think fliss has rescheduled this tour three times now yeah uh, but it has now been rescheduled for october i believe um and um they'll obviously be playing in birmingham i don't know if they're playing in wolves or not but um, no, they're playing the hare and hounds in birmingham are they yeah well yeah. they're playing all over the spot but um hopefully that will happen i don't know the answer to that but um who knows who knows? But meanwhile, for the uh, the serious podcasting enthusiasts, it must be a boom time for you, is it? Oh yeah, like like I say, the last year has been uh, have been very good, very helpful for me of knowing that people are stuck at home and they yeah, haven't got yeah. much option but to talk to people like me. <laughs> Grainy uh, conversations on the internet Absolutely. are the only way. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun talking yeah. to you. Thank uh, you so and, much, Michael. And I'll see you in person, hopefully, one of these days when we come back. Definitely. All right. In his most <laughs> revealing interview ever, <laughs> Robert Lloyd gives both barrels to the record industry of the early 90s. People could not idolise me. He never once joined in with any of the movements, any of the trends, any of the fads. They never wanted to compromise. Coming up in this song, I always used to think that when I pegged it, all of a sudden people would buy the records and pretend they liked us all along. But I begin to worry that what if I peg it and they still don't buy the records? <laughs> Shop treatment item for you, which was John Taylor. Yeah. Yeah, from Duran Duran. Yeah. That's a barefaced lie. What I like about this as a documentary idea is it is already based on an unsure false history. That's a hit haircut, that is. Look at that. That's the thing that a bloke with a hip does. They've got Lifetime Achievement Awards yeah. and he's got lives in hell. <laughs> live in hell. <laughs> live in Wellington. In Birmingham, they used to have a King Kong statue. What does that represent? Nothing. Birmingham rejected the statue. When I started thinking about the Nightingales and Rob Lloyd and the prefects, I thought maybe there's some way of using images of this to tell the story of you. Rob was my Johnny Rotten. I think everybody who has mainstream success wishes they were a cult hero, and every cult hero wishes they had mainstream success. Ooh, ooh, am I right? Am I? Am I? <laughs> it's a sort of charmed life, isn't it? It's not fixed in a time. It's still free, and you were free. I'm, I'm totally free. Gonna carry on whatever they, whatever they say. <laughs> You're in matched up condition. <laughs> That comes in better shape than you now.
You have to polish yourself, Mark.